well, boys. Looks like you started the fun without me. You're all sick. Every last one of you. We're going to need a bigger gun. What's the matter? You scared of things that go boom, boom, boom? My name is Eric, and I am here today in studio with Michael Kester. Oh my god, I'm so... I almost didn't make it today. For another episode of Double Feature. I uh, I thought you might call in sick. Yeah. Kind of like a high school student who doesn't have their homework. Uh-huh. Um, because I know today is Coffee and Foxy Brown. It is, in fact, Coffee and Foxy Brown. We're going to try and experiment by doing the least experimental thing we have ever done right. on our show. Right, Which is do a pretty easy double feature that kind of makes sense. And I'm going to do an experiment by just taking this list of reasons I have for why this is a bad double feature. <laughs> sure. Putting them in a trash can All and right. going ahead and saying that this was a great idea. I love it. Well, we're trying to answer a little bit of a question here. Mm-hmm. And maybe we'll come back around to it at the end. Maybe we'll solve it in the two movies maybe we're flying from the seat of our pants here but uh surely these movies can go back to back oh yeah they are a total you know new york slum box theater double feature Mm -hmm. right i would not be surprised at all if people start sending us marquees with uh sure coffee and foxy double build standard exactly grindhouse style exactly uh the question is you know we have two different views here now, one view is that uh, on Double Feature, our show, mm-hmm. we often fuck with the chronology of things. Sure. Uh, on occasion, we've done the the worst thing you can do, which is just feature a sequel and tell people not to worry about the, the original. Right. We've done that. Uh, clearly, we've done Terminator and the Prophecy. Which was probably the worst, worst thing we could have done. Worse yeah. than the other worst But thing. triple worse is the thing we're currently doing right. where we're stretching the Rocky movies out over an entire year. <laughs> so uh, just this once, we're, uh, we're reversing the karma a little bit. We're going to make it right. We're going to pair together these two movies that I won't say are sequels. I don't want to say that because that's factually inaccurate. Right. But I will say they were separated at birth. Or at least... Well, kind of. At birth... Foxy Brown was separated and pushed a year to, back. Yeah, yeah, pushed back to be a, a different I'll movie. That much. <clears throat> now that's one possibility. That's uh, that's just one side of what could happen here. That's the positive take on things. Mm-hmm. We restore these movies to some kind of glory by creating a time capsule where they're back to back. Yep. But there's also a dark side. There is a, a negative option here. What we might end up doing. Rather than having a great show where we reunite two long lost films, is uh, we might have a bad double feature for the show double feature. That's terrible because the show double feature is our show. We might have a episode here that's just redundant. Yeah, where maybe we don't have forty minutes because Coffee and Foxy Brown are so similar. Maybe we talk about Coffee. And by the time we get to Foxy Brown, we've basically covered everything. So that's not good for us. And I think that's primarily your fear. Mm -hmm. But, I mean, the only way to know is to, in the name of goddamn science, perform the experiment, right? This is something, I mean, we'll never know if we can do this again in the future until we've tried at least once. Mm -hmm. Now, honestly, the outcome here probably won't be one or the other. It'll probably be a little bit of both. We'll probably have a show that's a little short. But it's likely also going to be awesome that we, uh, you know, you type coffee, Foxy Brown into the internet and our show comes up. Yeah. I think those will both happen. You and I, really all we can do at this point, we've committed, we can just bring our A game. Awesome. If for some reason you've only seen one of these two films. You've seen both. I assume that. Yeah. (laughs) Well, yeah. Let's leave it at that. Uh, Spoilers. I don't know. Skip the chapter. Just skip to the end. Whatever. Coffee's from 1973, right. and I don't know if you knew this or not, but coffee will cream you. What? In fact, uh, they call her coffee, and she will cream you. That's the, is that a tagline? That's a tagline from the film. That is, I don't know if you've ever seen the taglines from the film Coffee. That is the worst tagline I've ever <laughs> heard in my life. Well, your opinion on that is about to change. She had a body men would die for, and a lot of them did. Now what's the worst tagline you've I'm ever I'm still heard? going with coffee will cream you. <laughs> It doesn't uh, it doesn't get a lot worse. It than sounds that, like no. she's going to come on me. What about How is that threatening? <laughs> well, I would love Pam Greer to come on me. 
Now, when I was talking to somebody right about when we were putting the poster art on uh, Double Feature, I accidentally discovered that I was a treasure trove of taglines. Uh huh. That somehow from looking at all these stupid fucking covers, I knew the taglines to every film. Coffee has another one, which is no one sleeps when they mess with coffee. <laughs> what? <laughs> Right, because you see energy, geez, coffee, coffee. Right. That uh, okay. That one. That one takes the cake. Jesus. Coffee o creamia is second place too. No one sleeps when they mess with coffee. Oh, <sighs> she's the goddamn godmother of them all. Uh, this is a movie what? by. The, is that another one? That is actually. What you don't hell? know about Godmother. <laughs> we could do this for fifteen to twenty minutes. <laughs> Just putting that out there right now. Um, this is a uh, American International, right? So sure. they were they AIP. were in this race, yeah, to basically beat out Cleopatra Jones uh-huh. because they didn't have the rights for that, or they lost the rights, or whatever. So uh, they threw half a million dollars at this project, uh-huh. and that got them a a thirty five millimeter golden Panavision uh, instant classic, which was coffee and it actually beat out cleopatra jones by one month to the day huh. to the cinema so yeah. really if you're asking yourself why does coffee exist it's to give the middle finger to cleopatra right. jones but it also exists because of jack hill yeah it so jack hill this is this is the reason that i was really willing to acquiesce as to why this was an okay double feature you would humor me yeah it's because i wanted i've been trying for a very long time to get a Jack Hill double feature sure, on the show, because I really like Jack Hill. I have a lot to say about Jack Hill, but I will admit that I still want to do Switchblade Sisters Oh yeah, on the sure. show, because that, I feel like, is one of the best Jack Hill films, because it doesn't fall into a niche. I would still love to do Cleopatra Jones as well, so maybe, yeah, we're, maybe sure. we're working on year five already. Um, But Jack Hill is this... Director from the 70s, he was kind of born under Roger Corman, Mm -hmm. who we talked about last week with Little Shop of Horrors. And Jack Hill, we've already done on the show when we did Big Birdcage, but he also did another film very similar to that, also with Pam Greer and Sid Haig, uh, called The Big Dollhouse, which I'm going to talk about a little bit more when we get to Foxy Brown. But Jack Hill is just this gritty, quick director. He's really good at... You know, getting stuff done on a budget and in a time frame. I mean, he's under the Corman camp, right? That's kind of how you have to operate when you work under Roger Corman. Right. And the other thing he's really well known for is sex and blood. Right. But the blood is without fail. The bright red looks like somebody spilled paint sure. on you blood. It's not um, as gory. It's more right. uh it's more splat. Yeah. It uh perfect example, first scene in coffee when she pulls the sawed off shotgun yeah, and right. points it at the guy's face. Absolutely. And explodes his head all over everything in the room. Yeah, that tiny little shotgun. Yeah. When I think Jack Hill, and uh, this is terribly, terribly wrong of me, but I have to think Sid Haig returning with more trademark accents, yeah, <laughs> which he may or may not continue through uh, through the rest of the film. But Sid Haig, I guess, just as much of a Jack Hill actor sure. as Pam Greer, even is. if it's a small role, mm-hmm. he's excited and he's really into the role, and right. he's always really well placed in the film as the perfect character for Sid Haig to play. So another uh, key element of coffee, as we start to look at some of the black exploitation stuff, it uh, has a theme song. Yeah, um, it has an original kind of soundtrack. Sure. Right. These are actual songs, though, with the lyrics. Questionably, questionably <laughs> songs. <laughs> songs with words sung over them. Well, I wanted to ask you about, especially you know, King George, uh-huh. who also gets his own theme. <laughs> I mean, these are yourself as a musician. Right. These are some of the best lyrics you've ever heard. Oh, yeah. No, I I can honestly say that there are certain rhymes in here. Um, you are a black pearl in a great, I don't know if it's wide or white world. Yeah. But uh, that, I know that that's one of the lines. Um, King George, uh, he's bad. <laughs> uh, don't take him for a fool or well, something. Listen. He's cool. King George, he's cool. King George, don't take him for a fool. 
these are these are the the stuff real musicians can only dream about someday writing these are the things that real musicians can only possibly come up with if they're put on the spot right to immediately generate sure. a song in about or if five they're seconds. in preschool you know at this point anybody who can get beyond but no one understands him but his woman sure that's a winner for me right that's an absolute a plus anybody yeah absolutely and the 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 one key about black exploitation soundtrack and black exploitation music is that you have people giving you responses mm-hmm. so you only have to write half the lyrics yeah right? right i mean shaft is a good example but it's in here too mm-hmm. you say you know king george and then somebody else goes oh yeah he's cool <laughs> yeah right like one right. person mm-hmm. is spitting out here's an idea king george and then the other person goes oh yeah it's almost the format of our show right i mean we could do a back and forth yeah that's in, pretty much how it works. musical for- if we had a wah-wah pedal yep we would be totally ready to complete <laughs> the rest of this episode so you know a couple weeks back we're talking about uh the wrong man we're talking about defining it um, using uh, film noir ideas because it wasn't a piece of film noir. Right. It was kind of uh, the opposite of that. Mm-hmm. And I got to thinking, you know, as much as I ramble on about film noir, black exploitation is one of those things where I believe you've seen every movie. I've seen pretty much every black exploitation film. So that I can that I've ever heard of both coffee and Foxy Brown definitely uh, get picked out as oh, key yeah. pieces sure of black exploitation. But I'm wondering if I can sort of get your perspective on how those fall into that, what kind of elements you see a lot, but what stuff you know isn't included. Yeah, so what I what I actually noticed because coffee and foxy brown were among probably the first five black exploitation films i'd ever oh, seen sure. in Mine my as well. life yeah um and what i ended up discovering due to expectations delivered mostly through jack hill but mm-hmm. through coffee specifically coffee is that black exploitation films tend not to be violent or as sexually driven sure especially with female leads Cleopatra Jones is a really good example, sure. but you know when there's a male lead, he's 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 attractive. Women are into him, but the sex is never really shown in an exploitative fashion. Yeah, it's always a very serious romantic thing. In coffee, sex is a tool. Sex is totally being exploited. Pam Greer is the fucking hottest woman on the planet. Mm. So it's no question that Jack Hill is going to have her be naked and show plenty of blood. Right. But that's not characteristic of black exploitation. What's characteristic is corruption in the black community. Usually somebody trying to manipulate the black community through keeping them oppressed using drugs. Sure. And usually some corrupt political scheme um we see a little bit of that yeah. stuff in here well in coffee there's the whole congressman and how he's gonna rise to the top but he's playing both sides he's yeah. lying to the black community for votes and then lying to the white community it's just a lot of it is power play and then one person steps up and is the real voice of the sure. black community sure right and uh or in some cases three people but it's always just this kind of mix of black people being oppressed and then black people getting themselves out of the situation. And usually there in 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 a lot of cases there are no white people. Right. Whatsoever that play any key role in the film and I feel like coffee is just I mean it's a really exemplary film as black exploitation as long as you accept that there's not going to be as much blood or sex in anything else you watch also probably fewer lesbians there are a lot of lesbians they get you know i love that they're in that brothel and one woman has to do the phones yeah because she's the operator and she just <laughs> pretends to be all the other girls but um you know in hitting a lot of the staples of the genre these two films managed to be pretty similar as yeah. we'll talk about a little sure. bit more in in Foxy Brown 
I think we covered the genre pretty well when we did things like Shaft. Sure. Or Black Dynamite. Black Dynamite's really good. But we definitely had male leads Mm -hmm. in both of those, and we didn't have the violence that we had. I mean, uh, this is the end of your motherfucking life, you dope pusher. You know, the head explosion is not something you would expect to see in Shaft. Getting dragged behind a fucking car. Oh, God, tell me about it. That whole scene, I mean lynched and dragged behind that yeah. car the uh the drag behind the car we've se- i mean we saw it in sleep boy camp we right. saw it in uh argento's opera sure um but the fact that there's this sort of racial component to it makes it so much more not only brutal but honestly just kind of disturbing mm-hmm. it seems more wrong yeah it seems really dark and i feel like a lot of what coffee tries to do is have this latino character and this latino syndicate Mm -hmm. that plays in so that it feels less like the white man right lynching a black man sure sure so that they have at least a thin layer of protection from white supremacy right um and instead in that scene i believe sid haig still has the accent yeah and so they can get away with it just being a latino thing versus the black community and it stops becoming a hate crime even though it's still totally a hate crime well, because there's uh there's definitely a line you could cross there where sure. we go from fun sort of revenge Right. Um when it goes from exploitation violence to a racist statement. <laughs> right. Yeah, which is a line they're always walking anyways. Yeah. Um something like uh a bunch of white people going out and lynching, you know, men in the street would be uh I think far over that line. I agree. Yes. But exploitation, <laughs> all about pushing the line. Yep. I would not be surprised to find that somewhere in the black exploitation world. Sure. So you do get that violence. You get the the kaboom police car fire right. thing. The the thing that's made so much more violent by the screaming yeah. coming from the inside. But the thing that stands out the most to me and the the reason Coffee and Foxy Brown are really two of my favorites in not just the specific subgenre but exploitation in yeah. general are the the really heavy uh, sort of women's power kind of yeah. themes. Well, I mean, there are just, there are moments where you see coffee with the shotgun. Sure. And it is just one of the most empowering looking moments. Right. But, uh, perfect example, when she runs over the one-eyed man. Sure. Gets out of the car in the living room and is already, has the shotgun at hip Absolutely. fire range. Yeah. And just starts blowing people away. That is a moment of pure control yeah well that shotgun is that that's become the characteristic you know you hold that thing and you are a badass right for sure and to see her in the beginning of the movie and in the end of the movie um with that kind of firepower behind her Mm -hmm. i mean no one's going to fuck with her at that point unless they want to get creamed (laughs) she uh you know she considers herself a liberated woman they talk about that a lot um, she has this great honorable day job. She mm-hmm. works in medicine. She's a nurse. Yeah. I mean, coffee's a completely human person. Mm-hmm. She's just a woman who's been put in a situation. And instead of being a coward or being, you know, being oppressed like sure. everyone else. Yeah. And instead of looking for help from other people, she decides that she's going to have to solve the problem herself. And that's something that I feel like really differs between Coffee and Foxy Brown is that Coffee is just a woman who decides to take up her own defense. Whereas Foxy Brown is Foxy a super Brown soldier. Is a super spy. Yeah, but Coffee does get her fair share of fighting. It's oh, yeah. not that oh, she's yeah. not tough. Not at all. She's keeping people off the junk. <laughs> she is you know, she has that scene where she has uh I think it's Priscilla, right? Yeah. She's pinned down. The one that's shot on the the weirdest fucking yeah, angle. It's so cool. Yeah, the the composition of that frame is really great, and she's got the bottle, uh, the all chick fights. Mm-hmm. Um, where uh, how do you defeat people in those fights? Uh, I believe you have to rip their shirt off. Yeah, rip the top open, and they're gone. It's kind of uh, they make fun of that a lot when there's a bunch of people versus one individual, and you punch them back, and they flail around for five minutes before coming right. forward. I think we talked about this in Enter the Dragon. Yeah. Um, yeah. But here, you tear open a shirt, and they're down. That's right. it. I mean, I guess they have to cover themselves, humility, something. There you go. The other part of this character, and something Pam Greer came up with, and I think 
is maybe I'm at least going to challenge the internet and say that this is the first time this has happened. All right. Coffee pulls things out of her afro and puts stuff in and puts things into her afro. Or uh, it's a lot less afro in this movie and more. It's just afro hair. once and a kind of a bouffant hairdo. The other bouffant time. hairdo, excellent. So she's concealing things inside her hair. Right. I'm wondering if this is where this came from or if this has ever been done before. Double feature show at gmail.com. Here and now, Foxy Brown. Okay, so before we get into Foxy Brown the film, I have a little bit more to say about Jack Hill, and I feel like this is going to clear up a lot of uh, what people may have furrowed their brow at Sure. when watching these two films, especially if you watch them back-to-back like we did. Mm-hmm. Jack Hill, if you go on his fucking Wikipedia page, if you know anything about Jack Hill, sure, he is an exploitation director. Right. That is his MO. That is his job. That's where his money came from. That is his identity in film in the 70s. So we talked about the big birdcage mm-hmm. on the show when we did it back with Cannibal Holocaust. Right. And as I mentioned during Coffee, there's another film he did called The Big Dollhouse, also starring Pam Greer and Sid Haig, Women in Prison movie. Right. Came first. And essentially he goes, or he doesn't, but the producer goes, that did well. Could you do that again? Sure. And Jack Hill says, absolutely, I can do that again. And I'll tell you right. what, I'll go, I'll do one better. And he exploits his own film mm-hmm. to make more money. Right. Imagine, so if you write a great book and it's called, I don't know, I don't give a shit. doesn't matter. Fuck this analogy. <laughs> I think people get where you're going with this. Yeah. So basically what happens with Foxy Brown is coffee does well. Mm-hmm. People really love coffee. And so Jack Hill basically gets asked to do coffee again. Not a sequel. Right. Not a remake, but a film that will... Not a Japanese ex- one. Right. Not a Japanese one. But a film that will exploit the success of his previous sure, film. Sure. And that's where Foxy Brown comes from and why it's so similar. Because if it's not broke, don't fucking fix it. Yeah, this is uh, hoping to lure in maybe some of the audience that saw coffee and maybe some of the audience who didn't see coffee. Right. Uh, whereas before they were concentrating on one upping Cleopatra Jones, successful. Also, by the way, they took half a million dollars and made a movie that banked $2 million. There you go. So I think you call that a success. And you know what? Foxy Brown was successful too. But here they are, nine months later, right. this movie comes out. They have uh, the same studio giving Jack Hill another half million uh-huh. dollars. He actually started doing this as a sequel to Coffee before the studio decided, ah, you know what? We'll just do it as a different yep. movie and it'll make more money. And uh, the working title, I think, was Burn Coffee Burn, huh. which, you know, I love me some taglines. So yeah. a title like Burn Coffee Burn, amazing. <laughs> but eventually they decide they don't want a sequel. That's a smart move because it opens up a whole new line of uh, catchphrases. Oh. Well, now the character has a different name that you can rhyme sure. with. Which are such as? Uh, I don't know. Don't mess around with Foxy Brown. Is that Is one that, of them? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, there was one, uh, a chick with drive who don't take no jive was how they describe Foxy Brown. Okay. There's a really, uh, a really fucking bizarre one. I remember it as being. There's a bizarre one? It's a, it's like a paragraph. From, um, okay. She's brown sugar and spice, but if you don't treat her nice, put you on ice was the end of it. She'll put you on. Yeah, that's what? what it was. I'm really impressed with myself that I was able to do that. Uh, brown sugar and spice, if you don't treat her nice, she'll put you on ice. That, that is. The, Awful. That's the tagline. I believe that, that's an entire poster yeah. for uh, for Foxy Brown. Wow. And this is Jack Hill's last movie with Pam Greer. This is the yeah. fourth one he's done. Uh huh. And this would be the last one. And it's Pam Greer in a lot different way than we see in Coffee. Sure. You can see where that kind of came from the same character. Oh yeah. But this is. I mean, d- there's more the confidence, term, more definition. Super spy. There's yeah. more super spy. Yeah, I, I mean, you're you exploiting you the that. parts of coffee that people liked, which was when she was a badass with a shotgun. Right. And now you put her in a bunch of outfits. A bunch of outfits. Let me reiterate. A bunch of fucking outfits. Well, so this reminds me of sort of the James Bond thing. Not uh-huh. just because it's a spy. I mean, yeah. definitely It reminds that, me too. of Bedazzled, but continue. <laughs> well, you know what? You're hung up on this fashion thing. Um... It reminds me of Bond in that, you know, they get a new Bond, 
Uh, the first one comes out and everyone sees it because it's the first one. And the second one has to amp up sure. what the first one was. Right. And you see this basically happen every single time there's a new Bond. Uh -huh. And they just keep amping it up. It gets bigger and bigger until it's so big it's fucking ridiculous. And then they get a new and, Bond. Okay. I've really only seen three James Bond movies. I wish I could unsee. Uh, I'm going to go out on a limb and say all James Bond movies. I wish I could unsee all James Bond movies. Can we get back to feminism? Please. I have to clean myself of this James Bond awfulness. So Foxy Brown becomes the more stylish counterpart. She does have a new outfit in every scene. Except the last one where she continues the outfit from the previous scene. Probably for the, the only time in mm -hmm. the entire... I mean, okay, we've talked about this before. Uh -huh. You and I don't drink. Nope. Not fans of drinking. Don't even really like being around drunk people. Fact. But that's your thing. Totally into freedom. Go ahead and get drunk. Fine. Are I'm you going to encourage drinking game? Drinking game. Every time Foxy Brown puts on a new outfit, take a shot. You will not get through the first, the first act of the film. How about every time Catherine Loder has a bigger necklace on than she did in the previous scene, also take a shot? It reminds me of the, um, the spirit and Samuel Jackson yeah. and the bigger guns. The guns. Right. So we're also doing something different with the music, too. Aside from getting these, uh, these lyrical songs <laughs> with the terrible, terrible lyrics that are about, you know, each person. Which, I mean, terrible, but wonderful. Wonderfully enjoyable. So glad those Absolutely songs exist. Absolutely characteristic of the film. We sound so sarcastic, but seriously. Definitely serious. So glad those songs are in the movie. I'm going to run off to iTunes and purchase them now. I might actually find a link and put them in the show notes Fantastic. if I can find the soundtracks for both of these movies. The soundtrack for this movie is all uh, Willie Hutch stuff, who admittedly, I don't know a lot about Motown, right? He's a big, big, big Motown guy. Uh -huh. And uh, it's just something I've never really, I find it like the Beatles. It's something I know I want to go learn about, but I just, it, there's too much and I uh -huh. don't have time and I'm just not there yet. But it's all of that, you know, very, very signature, fast percussion kind of wah-wah stuff. All the music in Foxy Brown, I mean. Right. The, um, the bongos and the, I don't know if it's a, like a heavy hi-hat or a shaker. It's a hi-hat or a shaker or both simultaneously. Sure. It kind of sounds like a little open and close on the yeah. hi-hat. But you know what I mean. The percussion yep. is all very fast and then the wah just can't be bothered. It's just taking its, it's just taking its time. It's just doing its own thing. It's following its own path. Yeah. The fucking wah, cool as a motherfucker. Shut your mouth. And the album was, in fact, released uh, on Motown as well. Right. So the movie might even be considered more typical of some of the black exploitation sure. elements, uh, especially when the movie really starts speaking its mind. You know, Link, uh, <laughs> Link has that bit of dialogue. Link being Black Perry Farrell. Right. I will never let that <laughs> that's, go. That's absolutely Link is Black fine. Perry Farrell. I'm not a big movie quotation person, probably because, as you mentioned uh, on an earlier episode, I usually see movies once or twice, yeah. the more recent stuff we're doing, uh -huh. uh, just not having time like I did in the first couple of years where I've seen everything sure. a thousand goddamn right. times. Also, uh, Napoleon Dynamite is the other reason that I don't like quoting films. Well, Napoleon Dynamite is not a film, nor is it a movie, by the way, so we don't even have to worry about that. Let's go back to that Fargo checklist. Do you want to talk about old episodes? So Link talks about how he can't sing, he can't dance, he yeah. can't preach, he's too small to play football, and too ugly to be the mayor. I love that. If that's not the film's opinion of how the black community is oppressed... Yeah, or at least portrayed in film, right? Well, that could be it, too. <laughs> it could be commentary by this point. I mean, we're talking 74, so there's definitely sure. still ground to be uh, kind of paved here. Right, but, but black exploitation has certainly been around. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely, it has. And so that's his excuse. That's his excuse for dealing drugs or having no job or mm -hmm. both. Being a deadbeat and having nowhere to put all of his motivation. Well, this is also the movie that, uh, as I know you love, points out that vigilante justice is as American as apple fucking pie. Yeah. <laughs> that, it, I love it and hate it simultaneously. <laughs> right. Right. Because it's so not. Right. But also uh, film. You yeah. get back to film. Once because again. it's, because it's fucking Foxy Brown. Yeah. Right. It's, it's true in Foxy Brown, but not in real life. Yeah. I mean, these are right around the Death Wish years. Yeah. I yeah. mean, before that Actually, stuff, Death Wish came out in 74, I believe. Yeah. So, you know, the, the movie kind of sensed vigilante yeah. justice. Here it comes uh, before all of those, those movies kicked off. But back to the black exploitation thing for a second. Mm -hmm, absolutely. Um, and we talked about it in coffee, how Jack Hill, lots of tits, lots of sex, lots of blood. Right. Foxy Brown, uh, not so much. 
Well, especially of the lead character. Yeah, that's it, for sure. It suddenly becomes a game to see right. if you can catch Pam Greer naked. Right. In the previous movie, naked in half the scenes. Sure. I think the problem is too many fucking outfits. Yeah. That, I think there's a different it. outfit in every sequence. That so covers up all of her private parts. Naked, not an outfit. Right. And she's naked uh, once mm-hmm. after she's raped or before yeah. she's raped or... It's, I believe her tit falls out while she's tonguing a razor blade. Oh, God. Can, hold on. <laughs> Can we pause for a second? Tonguing a razor blade is... I, it's on par with these horror movie splat pack moments sure. where people's nails fall off. Right. You know what I mean? Yeah. It just... I'm, I'm uncomfortable even talking about it. And like biting it in her teeth. What is she doing? Yeah. Get, don't tongue the razor blade. But of course, being uh, the badass super spy, you know, she has to tongue the razor blade. Right. That's how she gets out sure. of this, this sort of MacGyver Bond uh-huh. situation. But there's no, there's almost no sex in this film. There's an, almost no consensual sex sure. in this film, which is a lot more in line with black exploitation. Not so much in line with Jack Hill, but if you look at it like he's just exploiting coffee, right. I don't need to put sex in it. People saw sex in coffee. They expect it here. They're already at the fucking movie theater. Yeah, right. I don't need to show them. If Pam is going to ask for more money, sure, I'm not going to pay her. Well, because coffee almost becomes the trailer for Foxy Brown sure. at that point. If you want to get an idea of what Foxy Brown might include, the people who saw that and liked it are going to it. Sure. The people who had no interest in it, they're attached to Super Spy. Right. And by then, Pam Greer has finally broken into American cinema. And I'm guessing adds a couple zeros to her tit check. It could definitely be the case. So where in Coffee, she was sort of the first of her kind. Sure. Picking up the shotgun and being right. a badass. She is now really at the height of, you know, this, uh, this archetype yeah. that she helped create. Right. You know, we didn't have badass female superstar really until, you know, the days of Foxy Brown. Right. That's where that really became part of. Uh, being an American icon, Mm -hmm. part of what films would uh, pick up on and deliver over and over beyond that. Right. You know, you had these female counterparts uh, who could also have some degree of of badass to them. Sure. And certainly they existed in cinema before Coffee. Yeah. But at the point of Foxy Brown, I think Pam Greer was recognized as the one. Sure. She was the female empowerment superstar icon. She could easily carry the entire film herself. Mm -hmm. She was the the thing that brought people to the film. Oh my God, another one of these movies where Pam Greer is being a female superstar, karate, ninja, gun-toting awesome. And so that's a moment that makes this transcend far beyond a genre piece. Yeah. In fact, it might elevate the entire genre just because of of what it's doing. No, I fully agree. Now everybody has to turn towards black exploitation and take notice because of what this genre has uh has done. Sure. Maybe out of necessity, mm-hmm. maybe out of creativity, maybe a little bit of both. Maybe by complete mistake. It's found uh, a bit of a niche that other movies can all start to steal from. Yep. You know, heroin, a term I don't even like using because it just sounds like I'm saying heroin. Right. Uh, but that's the thing. It used to be for drugs. Right. And now it is Pam Greer. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Now there is female hero star huge. And um, and that's something that everybody kind of needed to stop and take notice of. Mm-hmm. And I mean, Hollywood surely did. You yeah. Know, the bigger sure. studios later ran with this idea exponentially. Absolutely. And now you see everybody reference back to Foxy Brown. Mm-hmm. You see that kind of Austin Powers thing. You yep. see... I mean, you know, Quentin Tarantino's Jackie Brown, Absolutely. a reference to Foxy Brown. Harry Brown, probably not a reference to Foxy Brown. You but never let's, really know. Let's go ahead and pretend it is. I mean, he's kicking ass. That's true. Everybody was like, oh, Harry Brown, Death Wish. I'm going to go Harry Brown, Foxy Brown. Harry Brown will put you on ice. There's one other name that I want to talk about because she was in The Big Dollhouse, which is the one we didn't cover. Right. But Catherine Loder. Oh, yeah. Who plays... Catherine Wall. Uh, Miss Catherine, please. Yes, Miss Catherine. Uh, she's always a villain. She's always maniacal. And she's always equal parts really creepy and kind of hot. Yeah. The thing about her is she's so strong that she can't be the female to a male's evil character. Mm-hmm. If the villain of the film is a male, Catherine Loder cannot play the female second in command oh yes she has to be the queen she has to be the boss the mother she is this 
giant force that just I have no problem believing she just manipulates people and has total control and you do not fucking question her. But maybe you send her a cock in a jar. Yeah, at least on paper, this is creating a worthy adversary yeah. to Foxy Brown. If ever there was one, I feel like Catherine Loder, especially Catherine Wall, the character, yeah. makes a whole lot of sense to be the antithesis to Foxy Brown. Yeah, and you know, when you look at how she interacts with all those male counterparts, mm -hmm. uh, all of her subordinates are men. They are her fucking slaves. I mean, she is clearly the boss in this situation, and you only ever see her down once, and it's at the end, you know, at the hands of our hero. Sure. Right? That's the only, it's basically saying there are, you know, two people who reign supreme over everyone in the film, Miss Catherine and Foxy Brown, and Foxy Brown happens to be That's a, just... a tiny bit above Miss Catherine. Right. Well, Foxy Brown is the type of person who will fly a plane through somebody <laughs> sure, and sure. chop them into tiny little pieces. Thank you, Jack Hill, for bringing your violence back at the end of Foxy Brown. Right. Save it, uh, save it all up. Well, but, that and the snip and toss. Yeah, I mean, that's between true. The two I mean, those. Foxy Brown will go the extra mile to put a cock in a jar. Is that a snip and toss or a snip and store? I think it's a snip and store. Yeah, and she really only loses because she brings a knife to a gunfight. I mean, literally. That's the, that's the literally thing, right? that. Well, she doesn't expect Foxy to take a gun out of her afro. Again, oh, there it is. She had not seen coffee. That is really her biggest failing. <laughs> Let that be a lesson to all of you who chaptered to Foxy Brown over coffee. What do you what do you feel like our conclusion is? We're going to spoiler free wrap up this one because I'm a little sure. I'm a little curious. How well do these work? Now, we've established uh, that we have a fear on double feature uh -huh. of being too redundant. And yep. We have two movies that are very similar. Yep. But we wanted to do them because uh -huh. they kind of go together. And because Jack Hill. So we know they kind of go together, yeah. and we know Jack Hill. Do. Yeah. Um, my big question, the the lingering question, I guess, is how well do they work in the continuity? I mean, if you were to say pretend style aside, uh -huh. that uh, coffee comes first, and Foxy Brown is the follow up to coffee. Sure. Do you think those really work as a sort of series? I think it almost works. I feel like there's a few key differences and pieces of dialogue that would have to be changed. Um, it's really easy to accept that her boyfriend in the beginning is just the cop from sure. yeah. uh, Coffee. Right. He ends up in the hospital, that whole thing. Um, so I guess it would work. I think I can see where it was written originally as a sequel, but I feel like by the end, there is so much... There's so much repetition uh -huh. with what worked in Coffee that it almost can't be a sequel. It's more of a one-up quill. Yeah, that was my biggest surprise finally doing these back-to-back -back because that was selfish for me, too. I've seen Coffee quite a bit. I've seen Foxy Brown a fucking ton, but I've never actually watched them back-to-back -to, -back to mm -hmm. see how they kind of line up. It's always been, you know, six months apart or right. something. And the thing that honestly I think separates them uh, enough to make that impossible is really the style. Yeah. That's the, the one thing that I think you can tell yourself you're going to ignore. I mean, one doesn't quite feel like the other. Yeah. It's, uh, it's redundant plot wise. And then the, you know, the style is so fucking different sure. that you're, you're telling yourself coffee doesn't wear these outfits. Right. Well, it's, it's gritty and glamorous. I mean, yeah. that is the difference. A bit too much glamour then to, uh, to put the two together. Right. But still a fine double feature. We, uh, we have a website, doublefeatureshow.com, where you can find more fine double features. We also have, uh, what's the, the thing? Mail? Oh, email. It's, uh, we have an email address, which email is address. doublefeatureshow at gmail.com. Definitely let us know what you think of uh, Coffee and Foxy Brown back to back, mm -hmm. what you noticed because uh, these two movies went together. Which is your preferred facial hair situation for Sid Haig? <laughs> sure, definitely about the Sid Haig. Also kind of curious... If people mind the simple double features, mm -hmm. ultimately it will come down to, do we mind yeah. the simple double right. features? The answer is yes. But, but, uh, but you know, a couple times a year, if the movies just kind of make sense. Agreed. Does it, uh, <laughs> does it hurt to move away from that? And uh, feedback, doublefeatureshow sure. at gmail.com. Awesome. But I think it's time to go back to theme territory Great. for a long, long time. And uh, the theme next week is the past, catching up with people. So we have two movies we're doing. 
Oh, uh, okay. Uh, is that the out of the past history of violence thing? Wow, that was good. You are on top of this. It is, okay. in fact, out of the past, which, of course, is a movie about something coming out of the past. Okay. Time and, travel. Uh, uh, and history, history of, of violence. violence, which is about, uh, it's a documentary about no. war through the ages. Not true at all. It's a David Cronenberg movie. Have you seen A History of Violence yet? Um, I no. remember you saying that was one of the Cronenberg movies. have not seen A History of Violence. Ooh, exciting. New movies for Michael. New movies for Michael double feature next week. Watch more fucking film. You want to say more? Say more. Bye.